Good morning. Welcome and thank you for being with us today <clears throat> as we gather in remote places to remember and celebrate the life of Tom Haygood. The service will begin momentarily, but if you would please let us know that you are here by saying hello in the chat. And if you would like to join us for a Zoom reception immediately following the service, you may do so by clicking on the the redirect button when it pops up at the end of the service. That will automatically enter you into the Zoom room with us. So now let us join our hearts and our minds together as we enter in a celebration of the life of Tom Haygood.
Good morning, friends. We gather in this sacred time in many places to remember Tom Haygood. We come together as family, friends, and neighbors to weave a web of memory, gently recalling the many ways Tom was known by the people whose lives he touched. While we come to celebrate the gift of Tom's life, we come also to mourn the death that took him from us too soon. We come to allow grief to do the work of healing. We come also to give witness to that which is stronger even than death, which is the abiding power of love. This sacred gathering is a sanctuary for love, a shrine for the heart, a time out of time when we open ourselves to eternal truths. Let us be reminded. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Thomas William Haygood Jr. was born on October 13, 1955, in Bruton, Alabama. He died on September 10, 2020, in Nashville, Tennessee, from injuries sustained in an automobile accident. During his lifetime, Tom earned degrees in English, divinity, and psychology. The majority of his career was spent teaching and counseling. He leaves behind his wife of 28 years, Margie May, their daughter, Sarah May Haygood, siblings Lane and Benjamin, nieces Dabney, Sarah, and Gracie, nephew Marshall, plus friends and colleagues too numerous to name. Tom's life was a gift and his presence will be sorely missed. We take this time out of time to remember him and to give honor to his life and legacy. As we let the words and music wash over us, May we be reminded that we are connected in mystery and miracle, that the tears shed in this hour are evidence of how deeply Tom was loved, that moments of laughter will buoy our spirits and help us to remember the best of who Tom was. Tom made his spiritual home here at the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Nashville. And so we begin by lighting the chalice. The flaming chalice is a symbol for Unitarian Universalism. It represents the cup of community freely offered and the divine spark that is present in every human life. In our time of grief, we light a flame of sharing, a flame of ongoing life. In this time when we search for understanding and serenity in the face of loss, we light this sign of our quest for truth, meaning, and community. Come with me by Rhonda Brosfield. God saw you getting tired and a cure was not to be, so he put his arms around you and whispered, come with me. 
With tearful eyes we watched you suffer and saw you fade away. Although we loved you dearly, we could not make you stay. A golden heart stopped beating, hard-working hands at rest. God broke our hearts to prove he only takes the best. It's lonesome here without you. We miss you more each day. Life doesn't seem the same since you've gone away. When days are sad and lonely and everything goes wrong, we seem to hear you whisper, cheer up and carry on. Each time we see your picture, you seem to smile and say, don't cry, I'm in God's keeping. We'll meet again someday. You never said I'm leaving. You never said goodbye. You were gone before we knew it, and only God knows why. A million times we needed you. A million times we've cried. If love alone could have saved you, you would have never died. In life we loved you dearly. In death we love you still. In our hearts you hold a place that no one could ever fill. It broke our hearts to lose you, but you didn't go alone, for part of us went with you the day God took you home. Don't think of him as gone away. His journey's just begun. Life holds many facets. This earth is only one. Just think of him as resting from the sorrows and the tears in a place of warmth and comfort where there are no days and years. Think how he must be wishing that we could know today how nothing but our sadness can really pass away. And think of him, him as living in the hearts of those he touched, for nothing loved is ever lost, and he was loved so much. Good morning. My name is Tom Salter. Um, one of my favorite uh, philosophers and authors is a gentleman that went by the moniker Dr. Seuss. And Dr. Seuss said, don't cry because it's over, smile because it happened. And I'm going to try to do that as we talk about uh, Tom today. But uh, I hope I can I can do him justice and and give you a glimpse into some of the things that you may not have known about our friend. Um, I met Tom on September 4th, 1972. The, the reason I remember the date was it was my first day as a freshman in high school, and Tom was my bus driver. And uh, from that day forward, we became really good friends, 48 years of uh, friendship. And I still can't believe that uh, that it's uh, it's over. I've been very blessed in my life with some really good friends. Of course, Tom, uh, Bob Taylor, Kyle Boyd. We kind of hung out together when we were kids, when we were in, in high school. And and Tom was, in some ways, was our leader of the shenanigans. All the, well, that's kind of a PG way of saying some of the things that we got into when we were young. And just thank God there were no cell phone videos back then. Um, but um, he introduced us to a lot of things. We grew up in a little town called Bruton, Alabama, which is the size of a postage stamp. There are more people that go to see a Titans game even during the pandemic than lived in that town. And um, I don't know how Tom was as sophisticated as he was, but he certainly was. And he introduced us to a number of things, wonderfully eclectic music from John Prine, Tom Waits, Warren Zevon, Jerry Jeff Walker, Frank Zappa, David Allen Coe, and, and so many, so many others. And movies. Tom loved movies. And uh, he introduced us to directors we never would have found on our own. John Waters, um, Kubrick, uh, Polanski, uh, so many of them, uh, Fellini, uh, most of them we couldn't even pronounce, but Tom knew about them and helped us learn about those movies. He also seemed to, Sarah, cover your ears. He also seemed to know the nightclubs that you could get into without IDs when we were in high school uh, to listen to cover bands of Black Sabbath and other, um, other music of our youth. Um, we would uh, try to pick up uh, girls and of course Tom uh, most of what Tom did was sit and watch he uh, 
He liked to uh, observe the human condition, and I think he took great pleasure in seeing us strike out again and again and again as we would uh, try to get an older uh, girl to dance with us or or um, whatever. Um, in high school, you know, there wasn't a whole lot to do in Bruton. Uh, we would all meet at the Dairy Queen or the Pizza Hut uh, to hang out, uh, and sometimes we'd go to uh, Pensacola to go to a movie or go to the mall or whatever. But <laughs> but with Tom, if you wanted to leave at six o'clock, you had to tell Tom to be there at five. And most of the time he was still late for six o'clock. We called it Tomer time and uh, it didn't get any better as, as, he, uh, as he grew up. Tom was a, a, both a quiet intellectual and, and what we lovingly called a, a big goober. Uh, we were we went to the mall once in Pensacola, and Tom had this thing he called liturgical dancing, where he would um, stand and um, do these very, very, very awkward moves, and uh, almost like he was having some sort of uh, of uh, either religious experience or uh, or some sort of a uh, what's the word I'm looking for a, a seizure. <laughs> I think it looked more like he was having a seizure, God bless him. Um, and we were walking down the mall one day in Pensacola, and he decided it was time to do a liturgical dancing, and it was it was crowded. I don't remember what time of year it was, but it was crowded. And he started liturgical dancing and ended up dancing. Part of his dance, the big finale, was in the fountain at the mall. He jumped in the fountain and danced around and then jumped out before any of the security folks came, but uh, he was uh, he was quite a character when it when it came to to that. Tom worked part time in a radio station when we were growing up. When I, I can't remember, he may have already been in high, in college in Alabama, but uh, I was still in high school, and there was this little AM radio station in our town, and Tom started working there part time. And Tom had quite an influence on, on my life and on my vocation, uh, including the fact that uh, uh, after I graduated from college, I went into radio for 14 years. And um, he was also an influence on, on my uh, job in high school as I became a bus driver. Um, because of his recommendation, when he graduated from uh, high school, they let me take over his butt bus route. Yeah, of course, back then they actually let 16-year-olds drive school buses, which is horrifying if you think about it now. But um, Tom left Bruton and went to the University of Alabama, Roll Tide. Sorry, Tennessee fans. I put the helmet back there in his honor. Um, but uh, Tom went to the University of Alabama, and I went to Troy. Um, but it's a couple of years into his University of Alabama experience, he decided he'd rather go to a smaller school. So he came to Troy, where I was, and we became uh, roommates. And uh, while there was a lot of shenanigans going on, then certainly um, I, I, I've heard a lot recently about Tom's cooking ability. Well, when we were in Troy, he had none of that. I think his best dish was a uh, crunchy macaroni and cheese, not al dente, crunchy macaroni and cheese made for the cheapest macaroni and cheese we could find. Uh, I think it was like six boxes for a dollar, something like that. Uh, he wasn't much of a housekeeper. Um, of course, neither am I, you can ask my wife, but uh, I remember one time at, we were living in a trailer and I just had had all I could take and I had to do some cleaning up. So I got the vacuum out and started vacuuming and Tom was sitting on the couch reading a newspaper. When I started vacuuming, he folded up the newspaper and started watching me. He didn't get up to help. He didn't, didn't offer any encouragement. He did lift his feet when I got close to the couch with, but, uh, other than that, Tom, Tom was an observer and, um, just a wonderful, wonderful man. In the early 80s, we found ourselves, both found ourselves in Atlanta. He was in seminary and I was working. And um, we used to go to movies. Uh, there were many Saturday mornings we would meet 
around nine o'clock at this Denny's in Atlanta and we would have breakfast and then we would get in his car and drive to the local movie plex and start watching movies. And we'd start at the 10 o'clock movie and we would go all day long and end up back at that Denny's about 12 hours later after seeing four or five movies to talk about what we liked and, and what we didn't like. Tom was a neologist. He loved to make up words and um, he uh, also not only make up words, but he had this scale. Everybody seems to use on a scale of one to 10, where would you rank this, that, or the other? Where Tom didn't like one to 10, he said it wasn't subtle enough. So we, we ranked everything on a one to 20 scale. But I don't know, you know, he loved to make up words and I don't know if he ever called Sarah by her proper name when she was young, unless maybe he had an issue with her. Uh, he came up with all sorts of names and I, I don't think there were ever two exactly the same. I remember one, I think it was called Rubalua, Rubalu, something like that, that he would call her occasionally. Um, some of the words that Tom made up will remain forever in our little group. Um, but yeah, very special meanings and we'll just leave it at that. But perhaps his best example was he said, be a doing it. And um, I don't know if you ever heard him say that, but it's such a useful phrase. It can be a surprise, an expiration of, su of surprise. Uh, it could be something that uh, makes you, um, uh, when you're angry, but be you doing it was certainly one of the things you would hear. Uh, right after Tom died, the day after he died, I had a dream and I opened the door and he was in the room and I said, Clovey, and I'll tell you about Clovey in a second. Clovey, I thought you died. And his response was, be a doing it. So anyway, um, when we were in college at Troy, since his name was Tom and my name was Tom, people often got confused when they'd call and say, can I speak to Tom? So we decided we would come up with nicknames for ourselves and in perfect Tom fashion, he decided that I should call him Clovey and that he would call me Clovey. So we were both Clovey and that, that cleared up the, the, uh, <laughs> the, the Tom uh, uh, issue right, aw right away. Um, as we uh, grew older, uh, we didn't see each other. Of course, life, get, life gets in the way. We didn't see each other very much. And, but I knew I could always call Tom. I knew he was always there, always there for me. He would do whatever I needed. He was the best friend um, and the most reliable uh, friend. Um, he was very loyal and he loved, and he especially loved Margie and he loved Sarah and he loved Ben and he loved Lane. He loved his family and, um, um, no matter what else happened, you could know for sure that Tom loved his family and he loved his friends. In August of 2017, I think it was, uh, Kyle, Bo uh, Bob, and I went with Tom to uh, Atlanta, went to a Braves game. We had a great time. Uh, and it was, a, it was like we've never separated. It, we picked right up. Um, and I know that there were people around us who thought that we had escaped from some sort of halfway house with all the be a doing it's and other things, other phrases that we were using. Um, but um, I miss my friend and I will continue to miss my friend. I, I believe in heaven. And my guess is that Clovey is up there right now having a conversation with John Prine and Jerry Jeff Walker and probably Bear Bryant. And um, uh, he is uh, he's having a good time. I, I'm confident of that. I hope he's not cooking macaroni and cheese, but I know he's he's having a good time. I wanted to close with a lyric from one of Tom's favorite songs. And um, uh, it's from John Prine, and, and uh, he told me about uh, an instance where he was in a store and he saw John Prine there, and and John uh, was trying to purchase a particular item and the store was out of that item, and um, he was quite disturbed by that. 
and it reminded him of one of John's best songs in one of Clovey's, um, That's the Way the World Goes Round. I was sitting in the bathtub counting my toes when the radiator broke and the water all froze. I got stuck in the ice without my clothes, naked as the eyes of a clown. I was crying ice cubes, hoping I'd croak when the sun came through the window, the ice all broke. I stood up and laughed, thought it was a joke. That's the way that the world goes round. That's the way the world goes round. You're up one day, you're next, you're down. It's a half an inch of water and you think you're going to drown. That's the way the world goes round. Godspeed, Clovey. Be a doing it. I miss you. For the past 30 years, Tom Haygood was my best friend. We were compatible in almost every way, from our circadian rhythms to the way we chose to raise our daughter, Sarah. Tom grew up in a small town in southern Alabama, and although he was always proud of his hometown, he really preferred the life that a bigger city had to offer. Going to art cinema houses, museums, listening to live music, and eating at great restaurants were among his favorite activities. Tom loved to travel and photograph our memories. He was happiest when planning a new trip or adventure for us to take, and I was happiest just to go along. Tom was a great cook. He made 95% of anything we brought to our wine tasting dinners and probably 80% of our evening meals when Sarah was growing up. Tom was an amazing project manager at home. He repointed the backside of our house on Woodmont where the ivy had caused the mortar to crumble. He demolished our kitchen and two bathrooms and remodeled them with only a little help from the outside. The set of life books he ordered to help him learn the many facets of these skills are still on the bookshelf at our home. I guess I would say he was a bit of a renaissance man, for after all, he was highly educated, a gentleman, cultured in the arts, and charismatic. Most importantly to me, Tom was an awesome father to Sarah. He made her giggle with his silly faces and goofy body mechanics. 
He shared his love of movies with her and introduced her to Nosferatu at the tender age of four, but paid for it by having to sleep with her for weeks afterwards. He put up with the menagerie of animals and rodents we acquired throughout the years. He was the one to get up with her in the middle of the night whenever she was sick, since I was a very sound sleeper. He and Sarah frequently hung out on Saturdays when I had to work at the hospital. He understood her anxiety because of his own, which left me off the hook. We shared doctor's appointments, carpooling, and general entertainment of Sarah. She picked out family vacation spots from the age of five till about 12 when she started attending sleepaway camp in North Carolina. I would get birthday cards for Sarah from the both of us, but as she approached teen years and older, he would also buy one just from him and put something in it for her just from him. There was nothing he wouldn't have done for Sarah. Over the past few days, I reread the cards I received and tributes written about Tom. Kind compassionate, generous, always willing to offer another perspective, ethical, persistent, excellent psychologist who always took care of the soldiers, great teacher and mentor, were words that resonated throughout. Early on, Tom frequently overcommitted himself, and he had to learn to step back and say no. For the majority of his career, he loved his job and was very proud of the work he did. So that was the man that was Tom. I will miss him forever. He was the love of my life. We who live beyond Tom hold memories of him. Eternity contains all that is, all that was, and all that will be. From this sacred gathering, we move forward into time eternal. Nothing can take away what was or what is. It is the relationship we have with these experiences that shapes what will be. Death ends a life, but not a relationship. The experience of life with Tom lives on in our memories. We came here today to share the loss we all feel at the passing of Tom and to remember examples of times of joy at having known him. As we extinguish the chalice, let us acknowledge that we cannot extinguish the love he showed or the love we now carry forward. All who are gathered here will continue to reflect the light of that love into the world. May the light we carry in our hearts be a beacon of hope for all the days that lie ahead. What follows next is the interment of Tom's ashes in the columbarium here at the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Nashville, followed by a musical postlude. You will then be directed to a Zoom link where we hope you will join us for a reception, a time of reconnection with friends and loved ones, and a time to continue the sharing of memories and stories of Tom's life. I invite you into this service of internment here on the sacred ground of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Nashville with words that were written by Sarah York. We are here to return the elements that made up the body of Tom Hagel to the earth. Earth, air, fire, and water, joined by ligaments of the spirit, the binding of life and love. 
let silence be our memorial garment today. The bright sun, our scripture text, the breeze, and the sound of traffic whizzing by, our comforting choral anthem. Blessed be this moment of transition and letting go. Blessed be this sacred act. Blessed is the mystery of life and death which is our own. So I invite you both to place your hands on the urn that is holding the ashes that were once Tom's body. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, memory to memory, story to story, blessing to blessing strength to strength, gratitude to gratitude, spirit to spirit, love to love. The wheel turns over, and what came out of the earth returns to it now is peace. The wheel turns forever, Yet whatsoever love and grace and gift we knew from Tom is at the center of that wheel. The center which turns not, but remains as constant as the flow of time. Earth, air, fire, water, receive your own. We stint you not, but leave us forever. That is ours. So I invite you, Marty and Sarah, to do it. Place some of Tom's remains Poet Mary Oliver tells us to live in this world, we must be able to do three things to love what is mortal, 
to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. To all time and eternity, we commend the spirit of a good man. 